Hi everyone, in this video we will be comparing Hadoop's file system versus Amazon's S3 storage solution. Now if you are involved in many big data projects and particularly if you are using Amazon's cloud computing uh, infrastructure for your big data projects, one of the questions that you might have to address at some point uh, or might have to consider is uh, the option of using either HDFS or using S3 uh, in your Hadoop projects. Now that's really the premise of this video, just to quickly compare and contrast uh, HDFS versus S3 and uh, we'll try and understand a few details and uh, finally uh, I can provide some recommendations in terms of where HDFS is a good fit or where S3 is a good fit. Um, so the agenda for the video itself, um, let's try and understand some of the facts uh, about the S3 storage solution. Uh, and then we'll take a look at some of the key decision parameters, um, how you can compare and contrast uh, HDFS versus S3. And finally, uh, we'll take a look at what could potentially be a hybrid approach. So as with most uh, compelling and strong options, um, it's not necessarily a case of one or the other. Uh, it could be a case where you're using both HDFS and S3 uh, for your big data projects and we'll take a look at what that hybrid approach could look like. So first off, uh, a couple of quick facts. Um, so when we are comparing HDFS versus S3, it's not necessarily, in my opinion, comparing apples to apples because uh, uh, a few things uh, about S3 that uh, worthwhile highlighting that S3 is uh, strictly not a file system. It's technically what's referred to as an object store. Uh, for that matter, S3 doesn't uh, really have a concept of things like uh, a file system has like folders. Uh, though if you have used uh, solutions like Fuse or if you have uh, logged into Amazon's um, the, uh, the AWS console, it, it gives you an interface that kind of mimics a file system uh, or a folder hierarchy. But uh, keep in mind that there's really no concept of a folder. Uh, there's only a concept of a key. Uh, so anything that you see with um, uh, uh, which what might look like a folder name, forward slash, second folder name, etc. is really uh, just a key uh, and that's how uh, S3 accesses objects and stores objects using uh, an, uh, a key and an object kind of like a, a operation. Uh, the other thing uh, which is worthwhile keeping in mind is uh, S3 like um, many of the other uh, popular NoSQL databases uh, uses a model what's uh, referred to as an eventually consistent model. Uh, now, if you're familiar with uh, eventual consistency, uh, you immediately understand where I'm heading. Uh, if not, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, so, um, uh, how eventual consistency kind of manifests when you're working with S3. So, let's say you want to copy data from uh, a Hadoop cluster to S3 and uh, say you'd want to use a tool like uh, DiskCP. Uh, now, this CP, uh, when it tries to move data from HDFS to S3, uh, it might uh, encounter a situation where the file was written by one uh, one of the containers um, uh, used within uh, the disk CP, uh, a YARN container, but uh, when another container is verifying the data that it exists, it might respond and say that that data doesn't exist at that point in time. So that's an example where even though it's, uh, it's, it's been written um, uh, by one process, it cannot be verified by another process. Uh, though that might be okay in some circumstances, in many cases it might be annoying slash it might not work well with uh, your uh, preferred solution. So again, it's something that uh, you want to keep in mind when you're looking at S3. Finally, we have got some basic facts out of the way. Let's actually look at some of the key decisions. So when you're comparing HDFS versus S3, broadly um, these are the uh, parameters, if you will, that you can kind of benchmark or analyze one versus the other. So some of these are um, uh, require uh, a bit more subjectivity in the sense that um, it needs to be applied for the context of your project and your organization. But uh, in general, I would say these are the key parameters that uh, one would need to keep in mind while comparing HDFS versus S3. So the first one where uh, uh, it's really about having that flexibility, that agility of uh, building and, in, and supporting an infrastructure for big data projects. Uh, and what I mean by this is um, uh, 
that S3 really allows you to decouple or using S3 within your uh, big data project allows you to decouple your compute uh, uh, against your uh, storage requirements. So uh, as an example, say if you're not using S3 and you're using HDFS and let's say you're using Amazon's EC2 uh, infrastructure to put together a cluster. Uh, so what would happen is uh, if your storage needs increased, you would uh, again keep adding uh, volumes to your EBS or uh, you know, you're going to add resources to your EC2 uh, environment. Um, but uh, with S3, you completely decouple that away. So you can store all your data in S3 and S3, you, you, can, you don't have to monitor and manage the storage. It automatically or elastically scales up and down um, and it allows you to focus on uh, scaling up and scaling down your compute resources or your EC2 environments, like adding more nodes to your cluster, for example. Uh, so it's really um, a, a very flexible model and a lot of organizations have seen significant benefits by um, decoupling that compute uh, versus the storage. So this is an example where using just HDFS, you won't get that capability, but using S3 gives you the ability to decouple your storage from your compute. So hence uh, S3 uh, kind of has a strong play uh, if you are keeping this as a key decision parameter. The next one is really about cost. Uh, and this uh, this can be a bit tricky, but at the same point, it's quite easy uh, because uh, easy to compare because uh, in general, um, S3 costs, uh, again, it's hard to put a number on it because it, it depends on, of course, uh, the storage size, uh, the, uh, the kind of like a range of uh, storage that you need. It also factors in um, the uh, the location uh, or the region of the service. And of course, uh, uh, the cost keeps changing. In most cases, the cost keeps dropping over a period of time. But in general, a uh, rough uh, rule of thumb would be uh, for medium to large size data, if you're looking at HDFS versus S3, S3 is roughly 10 times more cost effective than the equivalent if you're using something like EBS, for example, uh, to store the data. So again, uh, this uh, here, uh, S3 is a clear winner. Moving on to the next parameter, which is uh, really about uh, the SLA. And particularly when we are looking at SLA, if we were to compare the durability and uptime as uh, the key SLA uh, variables uh, that you want to monitor, uh, here's again a scenario where you find S3 to be really compelling. Uh, from a durability standpoint, which is uh, basically saying um, uh, or measuring the uh, the loss or the lack of the loss of uh, your data and how durable the underlying subsystem is, uh, S3 gives you an incredible 99.911. So that's 99.99999 going all the way to 11 decimals of 9%. Uh, and that's uh, amazing. Uh, it's very hard to build uh, an infrastructure. Even if you were to build an infrastructure using HDFS, uh, its native replication uh, over uh, over EC2 uh, to give you that level of durability. Uh, and also, um, uh, if you're spinning up your own cluster to manage that level of uptime, uh, it's uh, it's um, it's normal uh, to find 99.99, uh, but um, uh, given S3's uh, both durability and uptime uh, being so remarkable, uh, here again it's um, it's a, a very very strong candidate to use S3. So again, for that level of SLA and the cost uh, combined, uh, S3 is uh, really compelling. The next parameter is about performance. Uh, so this is a case where HDFS starts to shine. Uh, of course, the data here is uh, more local uh, than having the data in S3. Uh, and performance, uh, again, is a magnitude of times uh, faster on HDFS. Uh, typically, um, uh, read-write performance, you'll find it's a factor of two to three times more faster on HDFS. Uh, of course, you have the data locality um, uh, to factor in, and hence uh, HDFS is really, really fast. 
Uh, however, even with uh, HDFS being fast, there are a few things that you can do to uh, increase the, uh, the performance of uh, data and access to that data on S3. Uh, so uh, just to give you an example, let's say uh, you have a, a fairly large volume of data in S3 um, and you're using, say, Spark to uh, query some of that data. Uh, so Spark uh, uh, uses a much smaller block uh, size when loading data from S3 than HDFS. Uh, so uh, say, uh, depending on your distribution of Hadoop, um, it could be um, anywhere between three to four times uh, smaller block size that it uses to pull data from S3, which basically means that it allows much more parallelism should you have more cores to support um, querying that data. So again, if you have a lot of compute or core resources available, uh, you'll find that you can use that as a strategy to uh, compensate for uh, the latency of loading data from your Hadoop cluster and S3. But that's just a quick example of how you can overcome some of the performance bottlenecks. Um, but then there are some uh, serious uh, scenarios that you will want to consider when you're writing data to S3. Um, I think it deserves a, 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 a full video on its own, how um, some of the gotchas with regard to writing data using say Spark and uh, Parquet format over S3. Again, I'll cover that in a separate video, but suffice to say that um, when it comes to pure raw performance, HDFS wins hands down. Finally, there are some other design considerations that uh, you will want to keep in mind uh, um, when you're considering S3. Um, so these are considerations that you wouldn't have to worry about if you're using HDFS. So as an example, even though S3 gives you that elastic uh, performance and scale, uh, it requires uh, special design considerations in terms of how you define your keys. Uh, so normally um, uh, you want to keep unique characters uh, in your key on the left side of your key and not on the right, I mean, not the, at the end of your key, but at the beginning of your key. Uh, so immediately after the bucket name, uh, the first slash, um, uh, the, uh, the first few characters after that first forward slash is something that you want to use, something like a hash, for example, to generate the first uh, a uh, few characters. Now, at first glance, that might seem okay, but uh, you'll find that uh, that really complicates how you're going to query uh, the data in S3 and various other complications. Uh, again, that's a best practice recommended by S3 and Amazon, but um, again, you'll find that your mileage to using that uh, recommendation will vary based on your data processing as well as your querying tools that you're using uh, with S3. So again, in summary, those are the various decision parameters um, when considering HDFS versus S3. Now, uh, we have seen that uh, while S3 has some uh, very compelling uh, um, positions across these parameters, there are some places where it falls short. Uh, so this is where we can look at uh, something like a hybrid approach that uh, benefits from using both HDFS as well as S3 uh, in your big data projects. Uh, so to give you an idea of what uh, a hybrid approach might look like, uh, so let's say uh, you have a fairly large uh, Hadoop cluster here. Uh, and this is a cluster that's um, working in tandem with um, data sitting inside of S3. Um, now, uh, to begin with, this might not be the only cluster. There could be a number of other clusters uh, within your overall solution. But uh, this is a fairly large cluster. It's intended for processing data fast because it processes data locally. Uh, so as an example, we might use um, the uh, S3 to store long-term data, uh, that um, uh, long-term and very large data sets. So for example, you might use S3 to house data uh, that's much older, like say 10-year-old data, 15-year-old data, etc. But you're using your Hadoop cluster to only store and process data on a regular basis, which is more recent, like the last five years worth of data, for instance, and uh, thus keeping older, less used data or infrequently used data within S3. Uh, so that's a, a typical strategy where you can use both HDFS to get that fast processing, but uh, for data that's not that frequently used, you still continue to rely on S3. Uh, 
Um, and accessing the data between Hadoop and S3 can be done in one of two ways. Uh, option number one is um, you have data uh, sitting inside of Hadoop uh, HDFS uh, locally, in which case you can suck the data from S3 and put it into HDFS using tools like uh, DCP or Amazon's uh, version of it, which is the S S3 DCP tool uh, to pull data keep it in Hadoop and then do the processing. Or the other option is um, you can use uh, uh, querying tools like um, Hive and even Impala for that matter. You can point it directly to an S3 bucket and query the data or even use tools like Spark to um, use uh, data frames, for example, that point to Parquet files in an S3 and query that uh, or even process that data still further from Hadoop's, uh, on the Hadoop side. Uh, and once that data is processed and um, yeah, you want to uh, uh, push that data back into S3, again, you could use tools like Spark to move that data, or you can use tools like DCP, which is a basically, it's still a MapReduce-based implementation to move huge volumes of data between Hadoop and S3. Now, the benefit of this model doesn't stop there. Given that S3 now becomes your long-term persistence uh, for that data or the authoritative data source, uh, one of the benefits to this model is then subsequently or in parallel, uh, you could spin up other Hadoop clusters. Uh, so say, for example, you only have one cluster here, which is your main cluster, but you wanted to, instead of scaling this cluster up and down uh, and complicating uh, or the SLA that you're trying to support behind this cluster, cluster here, uh, you could uh, quite economically spin up these temporary clusters, which uh, uh, could be used for a variety of purposes. But uh, most commonly, it's uh, it's uh, the intent for these clusters are to do these ad hoc analysis. Uh, so uh, the main data source is uh, your Hadoop, primary Hadoop cluster in S3, but you might want to uh, hydrate um, environments which only have a small subset of the data. Let's say your data science team wants to uh, analyze data across, say, the last two years or across the Christmas period, for example, in which case you can spin up a Hadoop cluster, say, again, it could be an EC2 uh, environment. You can spin it up, uh, pull data from S3, perform that analytics, and then uh, kill that cluster. So again, it allows you to uh, kind of like add and remove these clusters on demand, uh, which uh, can be uh, quite complex when you're dealing with just a Hadoop environment, but using Hadoop's HDFS alongside S3, uh, we can build these uh, more comprehensive, uh, broader data lake-like solutions uh, using the benefits of both HDFS and S3. Uh, so that sums it up for this quick comparison of uh, HDFS uh, versus S3. Thanks everyone for watching.